So, how did this game make it out? How did this become such a cult classic, basically being shadow banned before shadow banning even existed? Because when you sat down and played that, John, it was a damn good game. Nintendo's most shameful character. M maybe even the most shameful franchise. You may know him from Super Smash Brothers. And that's it. That's exactly the problem. You don't see him anywhere. As if Nintendo was ashamed of this monstrosity. His games must have been trash. The games must not have had any fans. Or maybe his games had an outdated video game genre like the old point and click adventures. No. None of this is true. So why is it that this mystery character is shoved so far back in the Nintendo back catalog? Enter in Ness, one of Nintendo's original silent game protagonists. In the cult classic second installment of the Mother series for the SNES, Earthbound. And maybe the first installment too, I don't, I don't know. Believe it or not, there was even a third game in that series, but we're not even going to talk about how they did my man's Lucas. When Earthbound hit shelves in Japan in 1994, it quickly rose to the top of the charts, hitting number one on the weekly Famitsu Top 30 charts. In 1995, the West got one of the greatest games to ever hit the Western market, but you wouldn't know that at the time. At this time in America, RPGs weren't so popular, so Earthbound was met with pretty much indifference, where in Japan, RPGs were one of the most popular video game genres kind of similar to this day. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until games like Final Fantasy 7 came out that made RPGs mainstream in the West, which is crazy to think about. Considering RPGs are a staple in games today, hella games get the RPG sticker slapped onto them if they have anything close to role playing in them. Hell, Pokemon debuted one year after Earthbound's Western release, just for some perspective. It's also crazy to think about because the creator of the game, Shigesato Itoi, thought the game was doomed due to the extended developmental period. Employees had to work overtime, and they also had to travel a lot because there were two studios working on the game, HAL Laboratory and Ape Incorporated, and they had to travel between studios often. However, through it all, Nintendo of America's most shame franchise survives. One of the biggest speculated reasons why it seemed as though Nintendo of America wanted to sweep this one under the rug is because of the localization issues. Mother 1 and Mother 3 weren't even localized to the West until Mother 1 was rebranded as Earthbound Beginnings for the Wii U Virtual Console, a mere 25 years after being released in Japan. The whole reason why Nintendo of America wanted to change the name was because they wanted to introduce the West to Earthbound knowing they had no intentions of catching them up by introducing Mother 1. Which in all fairness has zero story relevance to the sequel. This brings me to another reason why it seemed Nintendo of America was cool with taking an L on this one. Some say Earthbound was a little too localized. Turns out the marketing in this game was OD weird and there was some pretty stomach churning quotes out there from real marketing teams to get American kids excited about this game. I kid you not, when the game first released in America, the marketing strategy was to make jokes about farts and human feces. Granted, this did come out in the 90s, so the fart jokes had nothing on the ass blasting Nickelodeon magazines being sent to unsuspecting families' homes. So, how did this game make it out? How did this become such a cult classic, basically being shadow banned before shadow banning even existed? Because when you sat down and played that, John, it was a damn good game. In the game, you basically play as a 13-year-old Ness as he forms a ragtag team of three other kids, Paula the Psychic, Jeff the Genius, and Pooh the Martial Arts Prince Guy, your pretty basic RPG team of the main character, the healer, the brute, and the item guy. In the beginning of the game, a meteorite crashes onto Earth granting Ness magical powers and a magical bee comes out of the meteor to tell you an evil alien predator named Gigas came to Earth and is transforming carbon-based life forms into monsters and taking over the minds of prepubescent blonde boys with bowl cuts. And it's your job to stop that. Shortly after, the magical bee passes away. <laughs> this is the type of absurdity Shigesato Itoi had in his games that made them different. This is what made Earthbound different than other RPGs. 
the game just oozes originality and it parodies iconic staples in the RPG genre. Even the theme is original, considering it was a traditional SNES RPG that came out in the mid 90s. The theme on a deeper level is about four kids going through life, acting as the adults should have, and unknowingly undertaking responsibilities way above normal kids their age have. Meanwhile, the adults are the ones acting like children. Now I ain't gonna run you down the whole storyline because one, spoilers, two, it's a good game, so you should play it. Three, it's a 28 hour story, and that's only if you know what you're doing. But what makes this game different? What brings people back? Of course, the game brought its own spin to what a traditional RPG can be like technologically and graphically with a loud color palette, ever so appropriate musical score, the deviation from overused RPG mechanics such as the overworld and the top-down isometric four-directional controls. But the game had character traits. If I were to prep you for this game, I'd quite literally tell you to mute all of your gamer instincts and play as if you were in real life making decisions. I tell you to talk to every NPC you see, not because they give good loot, but because you genuinely be rewarded with a dialogue of random characters. This game is a script writing masterclass, exceedingly rare in the traditional RPGs. Gamers play and enjoy Earthbound for the experience. It's not the Final Fantasy level of groundbreaking non-stop action, but a highly quotable meme game. Even wasted time in this game is time well spent just due to the whimsical nature. There are even insignificant missions and items. Shigesato Itoi said himself that I wanted to create a game with real characters. Characters whom players would recognize in the people around them. And I couldn't put it into any better words. Shigesato intended for this game to appeal to non-gamers, which explains why the game doesn't even take itself too seriously. In the first of my many playthroughs, I got stuck pretty early at a certain part where my path was impeded by a pencil statue. The game literally wanted me to use a tool called the pencil eraser to erase the pencil statue. By the time I put so many hours into the game ignoring all of my gamer instincts I learned from other games, when I came across an eraser statue later in the game, I knew exactly what to do. But let's set the record straight. This game is difficult, challenging, save a lot because on your first try you may not get it. You may die a lot especially if you're not used to the rolling health counter fast-paced battle system. Every boss is difficult, unless you're giving Mr. Belch his favorite food and you can distract him long enough to launch bottled rockets at him. Point proven. The game's difficulty may make you break your controller out of frustration, but one thing it won't do is bore you. There's always something to do in this title, and the whimsical nature of the game is what makes it people love the title. You really just gotta be there to experience it. So. Surely, Nintendo would love to bring this title back, right? A pretty consensus top 50 video game of all time. So, it should be easy for me to play it now, right? As of February 2022, yes. Yes, it is. Before February 2022, the only way to legally play this game was by purchasing it on the Wii U. And if you didn't invest in Nintendo's most shameful video game console to date, then I'm sorry, but you're SOL, buddy. I talked about some of the reasons Nintendo doesn't bring back retro games in a previous video, but luckily the fanbase annoyed Nintendo so much that it's on the Nintendo Switch Virtual Console, so I suggest you try that out. <laughs> After watching this video, of course. If my explanation for this game made it sound familiar, good, because it was supposed to. This game inspired many to make games with similar quirky dialogues and whimsical natures, i.e. Undertale, Lisa. It's also one of the reasons why I always have a special place for RPGs. That's how good this game was. So good that not only do many of us want a fourth game, or at least a nice fancy 3D remake, but for Mother 3 to be localized and released in English. But we have been waiting 20 years for that request, and we can see where that is gone. But we remain hopeful. We injured and earthbounded souls. I guess we will just have to play the fan-made English translation of Mother 3 until Nintendo decides that it's time for the ugly duckling to get some time in the pond. But yeah, in conclusion, this guy is a little bit more than your favorite main in Smash Brothers. If you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel to watch more videos like these. I also recently hit 100 videos on YouTube, so I think you should check out my not so extensive, extensive catalog. And with that being said, peace out. Welcome to the Crash Show. Take two.